stand with us. We continue to sing this morning. You'll notice very quickly all of our songs today are about love. We are celebrating Valentine's Day today, and the greatest example of love you'll ever hear about is the love of Jesus. That's what this song talks about. Love lifted me. You sing it with us. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. So much didn't realize uh, I forgot about Valentine's, but it's okay. It's not too late yet. I reckon I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. Okay, yeah, it'll be okay. Day's not over. You got the jewelry store on <laughs> We got Walmart, haven't we? Yes, we do. All right, oh love of God, how rich, how pure, how measureless and strong. This is a song you don't have time to warm up. You hit it running. Okay? Here we go. Oh, 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 oh. there's an individual in this room that ever gets weary or tired of hearing that special person in their life to say, I love you. Sometimes some of you guys have a hard time saying that, don't you? You know, you, I heard a man say one time that uh, his wife said, you don't ever tell me that you love me. He said, did I tell you the day that we got married? Well, yeah, but you hadn't told me since. He said, if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know, okay? But there's something special about when you hear the words, isn't it? I love you. And it ought to be special. Some, some of you guys made the day, go home, look at your wife, without any motives, just say, I love you. Just want you to know that. Thank you for being so good to me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for washing my nasty clothes. And thank you for tending to the kids. Thank you for all that you do. Ain't that preaching, Danny? I thought you were. Here we go. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice.
about music at all. I know Beck and Terry do, but we're going to sing this through round one more time, this song, of course, and I'm going to ask the instruments to back off. There's just something special about when we blend our voices together. You find a part where you're comfortable with, whatever that means, find a part and just sing it for Him. Don't worry about somebody standing next to you or in front of you. Just sing it for Him. Everything we do today is about him, Amen. not about us, okay? Here we go. I love you, Lord, and I shake hands at this time, give choir a minute to set up, but you know, there's a lot of bugs going around, a lot of stuff going around, so let's not shake hands for a week or two and just sit down, okay? There you go. The crown, the glory of heaven's majesty, and all the angels worshiped at his feet. But a lowly, dusty manger was where he chose to be, wrapped in rags of true humility.
this one last time, if you would. We'll let our choir be seated and our ushers come in and take today's offering. Oh, how he loves you and me. You singing with us this morning. so much. You know, the, uh, the Bible is often talked about as being uh, a book, and it is, but it's more than just a book. The Bible's a library. That's right. It contains multiple, numerous subject matters, uh, styles, uh, 66 different authors wrote it, and yet all it's all in perfect unison. Um, you know, there's all kinds of topics discussed in God's Word. It's often referred to as a how-to book or a life, uh, uh, an instruction manual for life, and, and that's true. Another thing that you'll find in, in, in God's Holy Word is a lot of love stories. The greatest of all the love stories is the love that God had for us himself, so much so that he sent his only son to this earth to live a sinless life and to die for you and for me. And he didn't deserve it. We deserved it. And still do. But he took our place. If you turn over in the Old Testament to the book of Hosea, you'll find a story there about, uh, it's a love story, about a man who his, his wife had, had fallen back into a previous life that she had lived in. And he, he had every right to have her put to death for that. That was the custom of that day. But the story goes that he went and he bought her off the, the slave block and bought her back and loved her. That's the story of what God did for us. He bought us off the, the slave block of sin. And he paid the debt that we couldn't pay. And we owe him for that. And what I mean by that is we ought to live every day of our lives to honor and respect the one who paid our debt for us. That's what this song talks about. You listen, you'll be blessed. Wrong song. It's the wrong song. Wrong song. <laughs> that's a good song too, but that's not the one we were going to sing. It's called I've Come to Take You Home. Crab Family. It's track number eight, I think. Yeah, I'm the king of ad lib. Yeah, you don't want to see me dance. Oh, did I say that wrong? I just okay. Let me correct something I just said. There are 66 books, 40 something authors. I said that in reverse. I've been I'm dyslexic though, so that's probably what brought that on. I'll probably say the, sing the words of this song backwards now that you've pointed that out. It's the Crab Collection uh, CD. It was sitting on top of the computer. We practiced last night.
I think it's track eight. We'll let you know real quick if that's not it. That's it. Y'all listen to the words of this song. Go plead with your mother were the words of Hosea as he sent his children to extend his mercy. So they journeyed down the old path that led to much destruction. All the while their anxious hearts were hurting. And their hope was crushed inside as their compassion was denied. The woman they so loved seemed like a stranger. Heartbroken and alone, and they took the long journey home. For sin now reigned, and hope seemed gone to change her. One day the word was told that some slaves were being sold, and a restless love sent Hosea seeking. That's what God did for us. One by one they brought them in, so beaten down with sin. Within his chest his anxious heart was beating. And all at once he caught her eye, and from his lips the bids were high she could not believe the voice that she could hear would he through judgment take her life forever in her pain and strife what would happen as she saw him drawing near he said i've come to take you home I know that you've done wrong, but for you I'd give my life. Through the sorrow, pain, and strife, I couldn't let you go. So let's leave the past behind. one more time he took her hand and said there's a new day just ahead I've come to take you home well I've stood in that same place bound by sin a broken slave and from the depths of my despair I prayed for mercy I heard his words the price was paid on the cross for you that day so take my hand now child and welcome He said, I've come to take you home. I know that you've done wrong. But for you, he gave his life. Through the sorrow, pain, and strife, I couldn't let you go. Let's leave, leave the, the past, past behind. Love conquers one more time. He took my hand and said, There's, There's a, a new day just ahead. I've come to take you home. Thank you so much. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, if you'll go with me and 
open up the Word of God to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 16. This uh, scripture and even this message may seem totally contrary to love of God, but in all honesty, it's probably one of the greatest demonstrations of the love of God that you'll find. God's done everything within his power to keep man out of hell. God gave the best that heaven had. God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, what more could God do than what God did to demonstrate his love towards you and towards me? Nobody is in hell today because God sent them there. The only reason that anybody is in hell today is because of a choice that they made to reject the love of God and the grace of God. Right. Luke chapter 16, I begin reading with verse number 19. We read through the end of the chapter. Jesus was speaking. He said, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. And there were certain beggars named Lazarus, which laid at his gate full of swords, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his swords. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. If you'll notice that word torments is plural. Being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember thou thy lifetime, receiveth thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Let me pause there for just a minute. The rich man is not in hell because of what he had, because of his wealth. The poor man is not in heaven today because he was poor, because of what he didn't have. They are where they are because of the choices that they made in life. Verse 26, he said, And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which should pass from hence you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. In other words, once you get there, there is no getting out. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. There's that word again. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses, and they have the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Father, <clears throat> I pray for these few minutes that, that we'll so understand, Lord, the gravity of the, of the decisions that we make in our life personally and the decisions that we make and how we live our lives before others. We are, no doubt, the best Christian that somebody knows, whomever it may be. And there are those that watch our lives. <clears throat> there are those, Lord, that are looking for someone that cares enough and loves them enough to get out of their box of comfort and invite them to Jesus. To invite them to hear the gospel in some way, in some capacity. And Lord, that's what every church ought to be about. We're not a social club. We're not here to impress anybody with us. We're here to impress people with Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin and the reward of heaven. 
Or do you help this preacher this morning to say it in such a way that people will get it, their hearts will be burdened for it. In Christ's name, amen and amen. For the last couple of weeks, uh, I've preached on primarily on salvation. I've done it intentionally. I don't do that every Sunday morning. I give the gospel every Sunday morning. But most of the times, I'll wrap it around whatever it is that I'm trying to teach. I've got a mandate by God as a pastor to try to equip you to do the work of the ministry. That's, that's what God's called me to do. And God's called me to teach the, all of the Scripture, not just some of it, but all of it. So my job as a pastor, and any pastor's job should be to equip people to do the work of the ministry. I'm not here to try to impress you with me. Uh, you know, how loud I can get or what sweat I can work up or anything like that. That's not what it's about. God's called every pastor teacher to equip his people to go out and do the work of the ministry. And that's, that's God's call on my life. So anyhow, this last couple of, of uh, Sundays, I have uh, I preached one Sunday on uh, the importance of relationship and religion and the difference of, of that. I talked about, about uh, the importance of being born again. Without being born again, Jesus said in John 3, you must be born again. It's, he didn't give it as a suggestion. He gave it as a command. You must be born again. And, uh, you know, we, I, I don't think anybody in this room or anybody that may be listening to me later on the, whatever how they watch it would uh, debate the love and the heart of God and the mercy that God shows, the forgiveness that God offers, the long-suffering uh, towards all of us, the patience that he shows to all of us. We cannot, cannot debate with that. You cannot debate with the love of God. But... We need to understand, even though, and I, I, and I talk with people on a regular basis, and they only see God through that one side of the coin, so to speak. The love of God, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, the mercy of God, and, and all that goes along with that. But to every coin, there's another side. There's a flip side, the same thing as far as God's concerned. There's another side to God's coin, and it's called God's wrath. I think it's imperative that we understand some things about the wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? Or maybe maybe it's best what it's not. Well, let me put it like this. The wrath of God is not, and it's important you get this, not some sort of an impulsive outburst of anger aimed at people that don't like him. That's not the wrath of God. A lot of people have a mindset, and they picture God being sitting up on a white throne somewhere and, and throwing lightning bolts and such as that at people that don't jump through his hoops and don't do what he does or says to do and all that kind of stuff. So what is wrath? If it's not that, what is wrath? Wrath is just it is the settled, determined response of a righteous God against sin. Let me say that again. It is a settled, determined response of a righteous God against sin. I think the most graphic revelation of God's holy wrath and hatred against sin is when he poured out his divine judgment on his son, Jesus Christ. If you want to know what the wrath of God is, go to the cross of Calvary. God took everything that you did and I've done every wicked thing that we've ever done or would ever do or in man would ever do. And he poured it all on his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. Every bit of it. You know, God has, I think, various forms of wrath that are demonstrated through Scripture. For instance, there is what's known as eschatological wrath. And what I mean by that is simply this. Eschatological wrath is in the final days, God is going to pour out his wrath and it's called the tribulation. There is the first half of the tribulation, then there's the great tribulation. And if you ever read the book of the Revelation from chapter 6 through chapter 18, you'll find out about the wrath of God. 
and what God's wrath is all about. And then there's cataclysmic wrath. That's like the flood or the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We'll see in just a minute in the, in the days of Noah that the mind of man was always on wickedness and evil continually. And then how wicked that Sodom and Gomorrah was. And it scares me to death to think of our preachers nowadays that are standing behind the pulpit and some of them are yielding in and giving in to this, this mindset of Sodom and Gomorrah of homosexuality and same-sex marriages and all that kind of stuff. And they won't stand. They're fearful to stand because of how people would look at them. I don't worry about what people look at. Amen. I worry about what God says. Amen. The Word of God is true, and the Word of God doesn't change. Don't tell me that we don't love homosexuals because we do. Just hate their sin, right. and so does God. would love to be able to share the truth of the gospel with them. So there is that kind of wrath. And there's several other forms that we don't have time to get into. But I want to deal with God's final and eternal wrath this morning. And that final and eternal wrath that God's going to pour out is called hell. Not an easy subject to speak. I, you know, I, I, I'd like for you to take a journey with me this morning. Okay? And here's what I want you to do. You're going to have to use your mind's eye for just a little bit, okay, on this journey that we're taking. And I'm not trying to be unscriptural in some things that I'm saying. I'm just trying to, to paint on a canvas with words in such a fashion that you'll understand what God's trying to convey. And I believe that you will if you'll stay with me. But before we leave on this little journey that I'd like for us to take, I, I you know, as a pastor... I, I believe in a place called hell. I believe that it's there today. I believe people are there today. Now, hell is not the final abode that those who reject Christ. The Bible says in the book of the Revelation, in chapter 19, that the final abode is a lake of fire. It says death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. But there is that hell today that's there. And it's not a place where the good old boys go down and pop a top on a Budweiser and just have a big time. There is no part in in hell. I can promise you that. And the Word of God certainly teaches that. And be honest with you, I don't think any preacher should ever preach on hell without a tear in his eye, thinking of those that are there. There are those today, and you know this as well as I do, that make a joke, and make a light of the subject of the reality of hell. But I can promise you this, hell is anything but a joke. Anything but a joke. There are those who laugh and joke and make fun of we who believe in a literal hell. And will stop laughing, I promise you, less than a second, less than a minute after they wind up there. There are those that think that hell is nothing more than a state of mind. Others who say that, that their hell is here on earth now. Many believe that hell is real, but they believe that they'll not last. If they go to hell, that they'll not last, that they'll be incinerated. They believe in annihilation, but there is no such teaching as that found in the Word of God. The problem, in all honesty, with all these theories is there's no scripture that they think to back up what they say, that it's a state of mind, that we'll be burned up and everything will be over with. God's word always speaks of hell as a literal place with real people and that they're there today as we speak. I have basically two reasons for speaking about hell this morning. Reason number one is there is an unsaved person, if there is an unsaved person in this room, or maybe later on we'll watch this, that, that maybe they would give their heart and life to the Lord Jesus. That's my heart's plea. I told my Sunday school class this morning, one of the hardest things that I deal with as a preacher is that when I give an invitation, nobody moves. I got over that a long time ago, though. 
I told the Lord, I said, Lord, as long as I'm faithful to your word and I'm true to the word of God, I'm not responsible for your response to what God's word says. Not at all. You do whatever you got to do. So my number one reason for preaching this message this morning is just simply, if there's anybody in this room or anybody that may watch this later on or listen to it later on, that they might give their heart and life to the Lord Jesus. My second reason is for saved people. This message is preached with the hope that we as a church and as individuals will do whatever we can to warn people about the place of hell. Again, it's no place to play with. It's no place to joke about. It's as real as real can be. And if you choose in your life to say, well, I, you know, I want to have more part in time now, I'll worry about that later on. Later on, we'll be too late. Whatever you do with eternity, that decision is made now. Whether you go to heaven or hell, that decision is made now. As a matter of fact, and I hope that you'll take this right, as a matter of fact, some of y'all, maybe in this room or maybe watching this a little bit later on, whatever decision that you're going to make about eternity will be made today. Because there does come a time in people's lives when the Spirit of God will withdraw from them and never convict them of their need for Jesus Christ. And they've turned their back on God way too many times. And God says, then if that's your choice, I'll let you have it. You can live with the choice that you make. I got to thinking about this. What kind of fireman would I be if I didn't warn you about a fire? What kind of a policeman would I be if I didn't warn you about criminals? What kind of a doctor would I be if I didn't tell you about disease? What kind of a pastor would I be if I didn't tell you about hell? I'd rather love folk into heaven, but if I have to scare them there talking about hell, I'll be glad to do that too. Doesn't matter to me. What would you say, listen to me carefully for just a minute, I, re I read this. What would you say about a fireman who saw your house burning down and they pulled up with a fire truck in front of your house and the fire was going with all kind of blazes? What kind of fireman would you think they would be if they said something like this? Well, if we'll just give it a little bit of time, it'll burn itself out. Instead of trying to put the fire out. What kind of a policeman who saw juveniles vandalizing your property and said, well, you know, boys will be boys, and they did nothing about it? What would you say about a doctor who, when telling you that you had some sort of a dreaded disease, simply said something like this, well, just take some aspirin and go home and rest? You'd probably say, they're not taking their job seriously. And truth is, guys, I wouldn't be taking my job seriously as a pastor if I didn't at times tell you about the subject of hell and the reality of hell. I think most of us have places and locations in our lives that someday we would like to visit, maybe after retirement or maybe on vacation or something like that. We'd like to go, you know, Sue Ann and I, we've talked about it that whenever retirement can take place around here, that we want to go out west and spend a few weeks just, just looking at America. I don't need to go to some foreign country. Too many things in America I haven't seen yet. Amen. And uh, there's a lot of places I'm sure that you'd like to go. But there's one journey that I've never wanted to take, nor do I want to take now, and that's a journey to a place called hell. Truth is... Personally, I'll never have to worry about taking that journey. Why? Because there was a day in my life I put my personal faith in Jesus Christ. And I've got a personal relationship with Christ. I don't have religion, but i got a personal relationship with Christ. Because of that, I don't have to take that journey anymore. I don't have to worry about it. 
anymore. You know, people who take that journey will never know the peace and the love and the joy and the contentment that God gives to those who receive Christ as Savior. And to take this journey, you got to use your spiritual imagination with me for just a little while, and I hope that you'll do that. So as we begin this little journey, escorted by Gabriel, the angel, down the halls of hell, I want you to experience a few things as we go on this journey. And I understand that, that, that it's a journey, and I understand I'm, I'm, what I'm doing this morning. I'm just trying to paint some pictures with words so that you, would, you could relate with it and you could understand it. Gabriel begins this journey with you and I as we go down the halls of hell. And as we step in the hall, all of a sudden we begin to smell the stench of burning and the stench of burning flesh. And we hear the cries and the screams as we've never heard before. Did not believe that that could take place. Did not know that something could smell that bad. But it does, because we're walking down the halls of hell. Gabriel turns and reminds us that no one was ever forced to go to hell for all eternity. Gabriel looks at each of us as we go on this journey down the halls of hell, and he says this, all that the Father did was to endorse man's decision of rejecting his gift of salvation. If you go to hell today, or if anybody goes to hell today that's listening to me, or any other preacher as far as that's concerned, all God is doing is endorsing the decision that you've made. He's not sending anybody to hell. You see, for man to go to hell, man's got to crawl over the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. For a man to go to hell, he's got to crawl over the preaching of the Word of God. He's got to crawl over the cross of Calvary. He's got to crawl over the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's got to crawl over every Bible-believing church for everybody that rejects the Lord Jesus and the prayers of those that pray for them on a regular basis. And so as we travel down the halls of hell, let's listen to the sounds that we hear behind some of the doors that we pass by. Take your Bible, and if you will, and go to the book of Genesis. As we travel down this hall, Genesis chapter 4. Follow along with me if you would. As we walk down this hall, all of a sudden we hear behind one door Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. That means he was a shepherd. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. Verse 3, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, meaning very angry, and his countenance fell. Verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why are you so angry? What are you mad about? Why is this thy countenance has fallen? Verse 7. If thou doest well, thou shalt not be accepted. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Verse 7 is all about a heart issue. Let me say this. Our relationship or lack thereof with the Lord Jesus Christ is a heart issue, not a head issue. You know, the Bible talks about in the book of James, we looked at that in one of our previous messages the last couple of weeks, that there are two kinds of faith. You say, I got faith, preacher. I'm in church every time the doors are open. 
I work in the church and I do this, I, 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 and all that kind of stuff. I got faith. Well, the Bible says that there's two kinds of faith, living faith and dead faith. And what, what the Bible is talking about in the life of Cain was a dead faith. In other words, he wasn't coming to God as he had been instructed by his mom and dad how to come to God and by God himself. But let's read on. Verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. He killed him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is thy brother? Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he, and he said, What hast thou done? And the voice of thy brother, brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And without tillest the ground, it shall be henceforth yield unto thee. Her strength, a fugitive, and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. In other words, there are a lot of things that we could say about that. No doubt God had taught Adam and Eve how to worship. And Adam and Eve had showed their boys how to come to God in worship. And the Bible talks about Scripture doesn't reveal exactly what the problem may have been. We just know, we learn from verses 4 and 5 of chapter 4, that Abel came to the Lord the way that he, he had been instructed. Abel was doing it God's way. But Cain chose to come to the Lord in his own way. Not God's way. As a matter of fact, you don't have to turn there, but it talks about that in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 4. Listen to what it says. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speaketh. Point being is, Abel came to God God's way. You say, well, how does, how does that apply to us today? Well, we have to learn to come to God God's way. We don't come to God by the works that we do. We don't come to God by how hard we try. We come to God in repentance. We repent of our sin. We, the repent means to turn from. We turn from our sin. We turn to the person of Jesus Christ and Christ only. We don't repent and turn to anything else. We don't turn to the church. We don't turn to good works. We don't turn to baptism. We don't turn to church membership. We turn from sin and to Christ and Christ only. There is no other way. You know, I think it's, I think it's strange how we're willing to follow the standards of man, but not God's standards. I think it's, I think it's amazing that uh, the man today will follow. Man says two plus two equals four. I mean, that's, that's pretty simple. The Bible, I mean, man says that there are three feet in one yard. We follow the laws of gravity. We follow the laws of highway as best we can. But when it comes to the laws and standards of God, people seem to have a better idea, a different way. I want to do it my way. That was a problem with uh, Cain. God's standards of salvation is still by grace through faith we're saved. We're not saved by any other way. So if you're trying to get to God any other way than by the grace of God, you're not coming by God's way. You might mean well, and I'm sure that, that, that uh, uh, Cain meant well. I'm sure that Cain thought, well, I'm sure that because of my mom and dad or Adam and Eve, I'm sure that God will, uh, will understand that I want to come to him my way. I'm sure that God would understand my mom and dad are active in the church. I'm sure that my, you know, God's going to understand that my dad was a deacon at my you know, or my dad was a preacher, or whatever the situation may be. I'm sure that God understands it. And, and here's the kicker. I'm sure that God will make me an exception to the rule. I believe that today is hell is full of people that 
thought God was going to make them an exception to the rule. But they're not. We travel a little bit farther on down the hall. And you hear behind a door, let us in. Let us in. Let us in. Go to chapter 7, Genesis. Look what he says beginning in verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth in 40 days and 40 nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of the son with them into the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the, to Noah, into the ark, two and, a, two and two of all flesh were in the breath of life. Now notice verse 16. And they that went in, went in male and female and all flesh. And God had compassion on them. But notice the last phrase. And the Lord shut him in. Because of sin and wickedness of man, Man chose, God chose to judge men on the earth. If you'll go back to chapter 6 for just a minute in Genesis, notice what he says in verse number 5. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. This is what brought the flood about. This is what's going to bring destruction of the world now. Genesis 6, verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was, was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. The word repenteth there it mean, simply means it grieved the heart of God what man was doing. Verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and the creeping things, and the fowl of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. Read on down, verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah, and was a just man, and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. And Noah, began, Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through, all them, through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. You'll notice in verse number 5 the word imagination Sin begins in a person's thought life. The people in Noah's day were exceedingly wicked, but they were exceedingly wicked from the inside out, not the outside in. Their thought life. Verse 9 talks about Noah said he was a just man. In other words, Noah was willing to live, live by God's righteous standards and obey the Word of God, what it has to say. If you'll go back, if you'll look in chapter 6 and verse 22, it says, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Talks about his demonstration of faith. But back again in chapter 6, the word perfect referred to Noah. Talks about this, this, this sets him apart from the comparison with those of his day. Didn't mean he was sinless perfection. He just was different from them. And then he also talks about, in verse 9, he said he walked with God. He lived with the thoughts of pleasing God and obeying God. It was evidence of his faith. Let me tell you something, guys. You call yourself a Christian, and that's great. I'm, I'm not trying to debate with you about that. You can say whatever you want to say, 
But when the rubber hits the road, it boils down to whether or not you demonstrate the faith that you say that you have by the obedience of what you do with the life that you live. I'm not saying we live a perfect life, but we strive for what God wants us to do. Back to Noah, for 120 years, Noah preached and he pleaded with the people to turn from their sin, from their wickedness. I can't imagine what all Noah went through for 120 years trying to plead with the people to turn from their sin and turn to God. Can you imagine what Noah went through when he went down to Home Depot, buy some lumber? And people stand back and say, hey, there's that idiot. He went down aisle four and people started jeering and laughing at him. There's his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. There's those three idiots. They're out there in the lumber yard. They're trying to buy some gopher wood. And some slime. I don't know what in the world they're going to do with it. They're building, they say, a ship out there where it never has rained. Ain't no water in sight. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Anybody ever looked at you and said, cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo? My wife does that to me every now and then. <laughs> but they went through all this. After Noah obeyed and doing all the Lord had instructed him. The Bible says there in chapter 7, verse 16, that God shut the door. And when God shut the door, I believe as soon as God shut the door, it started getting cloudy. You see, it had never been cloudy before. Why? It never had rain. Never had rain. All the water they got in those days came up from the earth, not down from the sky. And began to do something that they had never seen before. They didn't understand. Water began falling from the sky. And it didn't take long for the people to realize the mistake that they had made. But listen to me carefully. Once the door of opportunity is closed by God, the door is closed. Let me show you a verse. Keep your finger there. Well... Go back to John for just a minute. John chapter 10. Look, if you would, at verse 9. John chapter 10, verse 9. Jesus was speaking. If you have a red lettered edition Bible, the Bible says this. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. The only door to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And when that door is shut, let me tell you something, guys. Those in hell today will never come out of hell until the great white throne judgment to be cast into the lake of fire. Your loved ones, your friends, your husbands, your grandchildren, your neighbors, whomever it may be. Don't sit there and think for one second, oh, God's a loving God. I showed you all at the beginning of this message, he is a loving God. He's full of grace and mercy and forgiveness. That's on that side of the coin. But God is a God of holiness. Because of that, there's a wrath of God on this side. We want to think everybody's going to go to heaven. I'm amazed sometimes as I watch some of these programs on TV and try to watch the news, and they'll have some reprobate that's died or overdosed or something like that, and say, oh, he's just looking down on us today. No, not without a relationship with Christ. I'm not trying to judge them or anybody else. But today... The ark of Jesus Christ is the door, and it's open. How long it'll be open for you, I don't know. Only God knows. Go with me now to the book of Acts. Almost thou persuadest me. Almost. Acts 26, verse 28. Almost thou persuadest me. Acts 26, verse 28, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, 
almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Agrippa was a wicked king in Rome. He was living at that time with his sister Bernice. Paul went before him. Paul had been arrested and brought before Agrippa to plead his case of Christianity. And I have no doubt in my mind that Paul shared Christ and the gospel with Agrippa in the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe that he could have heard it any better. And I think this is good evidence that a person must do more than just hear the gospel. They must respond to what they hear. You can be here today and hear what I say or what God says. You can listen to it. That doesn't mean you're going to get saved. You have to respond and act on what you hear. Would it not be a tragic to go through life having heard the gospel and still die and go to hell? Would it not be tragic to be sitting in one of those blue seats for weeks, months, years, whatever it may be, and die and go to hell? Because you reject the gospel, because you sit there in your pride and say, I'm not going to step out. People talk to me. Who in the Sam Hill cares what anybody says? Get over it. If they want to die and go to hell, let them go. But you don't have to go with them. You don't have to. You say, what do I need to do, preacher? You need to get out of that seat. I need to get saved, preacher. I don't want to go to hell. I don't care what she does. Let her go to hell if she wants to. Tanya's not going. Let her. I should have sat down next to Sue Ann. You know, I can't change what they do. I'm not responsible for what Mick does. I got one to take care of. Me. And I'm not saying that selfishly. I'm talking about the difference between heaven and hell. And once God saves me, I'm responsible to tell others. But don't you sit there for a second worrying about what Chuck's going to think. I could care less what Chuck thinks. And Chuck could care less what I think. Chuck's mature enough to care about what God thinks. And it ought to be true in all of our lives. Care about what God thinks. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. I can tell you two things about Agrippa. One is he believes the gospel to be true, but he rejected it. Second thing, he's no longer king and he's in hell today. Let me give you the last one. We walk on down the halls with Gabriel. Gabriel turns and looks at us and he says something like this. This may be the most difficult door for you to pass. Because we hear behind that door, why did you not tell me? Why did you not tell me? Go to 1 Thessalonians. If you're in, in Acts, just keep going to the right a little bit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look, if you would, at verse number 4. Paul says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Now, let me pause there for just a minute. But as we... All of us, as we were allowed to be to, of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. You and I have been put in trust with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility. You know, when he, when he talks about we, it turns you in. Listen to me. This, you may not agree with this. It turns you into a preacher. 
You know what the word preacher has an idea of? It turns you into a proclaimer. To proclaim the gospel. Jojo, do you realize that you have a congregation of two? One of them sitting right next to you. The other one's about that high. Your children. The preacher that that baby needs to see is sitting right there. And sitting right there. And standing right here. That's the reason I say oftentimes we're the best Christian that somebody knows. And if you play with the subject of the gospel, you think something else is more important than the gospel. And we have people all the time that think, hey, listen, I think that my, my baby's involved in this and my baby's involved in that. Yeah. Help yourself. What you going to do when they wind up in hell? They're not going to play ball in hell. They're not going to shoot a basket in hell. They're not going to do any of that in hell. And you have a response. Man, I want my baby to like me. Don't worry about your child liking you. I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't raise my boys to like me. They like The oldest one likes me now. But it's taken him 50 years for that to happen. You say, well, that, that's, that just doesn't seem right. Yeah, but I'd rather have him in heaven not liking me than in hell thinking I'm the greatest thing there ever was. Boy, my mom and daddy, they just let me do what I wanted to do. On Sundays, we'd get up and we'd go do this and we'd go do that and we'd go to the lake and we'd go to the mountains and we'd do this and we'd do that. But I'm in hell and I can't get out. But I had a good mom and daddy. I really liked the way they treated me. Let me ask you this, and I'm wrapping this thing up. Uh, you have an opportunity to reach family and friends here in a, in a few weeks for them still to be saved. You know, you know, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be a crying shame if you're somebody you worked with or or somebody maybe you play ball with or whatever whatever the situation may be, and and they said something like this. You know, I didn't even know that you had a relationship with Christ. I didn't know you was a Christian. You never invited me to church. I, I, I didn't see Christ in you. We've known each other all of our lives, and you never once told me about your relationship with Christ. I would give everything that I have and own or will ever own if I could sit down with my dad and my dad looked at me and said, son, I want you to know I've got a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'd give anything I had. I don't have, honestly, anything. I want my, I want my boy, my, oh, my son that's in heaven, he knew that. And my boy now that's 53 years old, he knows that. But now I want my next, next generation to know. As a matter of fact, one of them told me the other day, that we know where y'all stand. I thought, mm. it was good. He said, I, 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 I don't want to offend them. I could. Why? The Bible says that you're going to offend people. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that, that Christ came to divide what does that mean? Christ came to divide uh, father from mother, a father from child, child from father, mother from child, mother-in-law from father-in-law, mother-in-law from daughter-in-law, and so on and so forth. It's going to happen. It's scriptural. I, I, I'm not thrilled it happens, but the Bible told me it was going to happen. But the people that you work with, the people that you whatever with, I never knew that you were a Christian. Well, let me wrap it up like this. God has entrusted us with the greatest message the world has ever known. The question is, what are you going to do with it? You don't have to turn there, but there's a, uh, there's a verse 
uh, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Of course, the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'll close with these two statements. Listen carefully and get ready to say. There is a way to stay out of hell. But there's no way to get out of hell. Let me say that again. There is a way to stay out of hell called the gospel. But there is no way to get out of hell. Do you know who spoke more about the subject of hell than anybody else in the New Testament? Jesus Christ. He spoke more about hell than anybody. And if he spoke more about hell than anybody, pretty well sure it's important. Pretty well sure that it's real. Because he talked more about it than anybody did. And it is real. And you got for, you say, but preacher, I can't save anybody. I understand that. I can't either. I can sure tell them how, though. I can live Christ in front of them. And if you're too busy with what you want to do and your child dies and goes to hell, may God have mercy on you. That's all I can say. Father, I know these kind of messages don't set well with everybody. I understand that. But I'm not here this morning for a popularity contest. I sure do want to put a smile on your face. I'm not, my intent is not to offend or make uncomfortable anybody. But again, Lord, if I were, and I am in one respect, if I were a fireman, I would want to do everything I could to get people out of the house that was burning. I'd do everything possible. And Lord, I just want to tell people this morning that hell's real. And those that are there will never get out. And those that reject the truth of the gospel will go there. And we are either a road or a roadblock for people to go to heaven. And for people to hear and be exposed to the gospel. Just let us, God, have a heart to expose people to the truth and do everything within our power to expose people to the truth of the gospel and then allow them to make that choice and make that decision. But if we don't do our part, we've never exposed them to it. So, Lord, I don't know what people need to do in this invitation. If there's here, somebody here that is not even sure about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I invite them today to come to me and let me get them with somebody that can share the truth of the gospel. And maybe there's some here this morning that's just, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me to be willing to pay the price to live my faith in obedience before those I love, my children, my son, my daughter my friends at work. God, help me to do whatever I need to do to make a difference in their life. Help them see Jesus in me. And lastly, Lord, there may be somebody here who needs a church home. And if they prayed about it, we invite them to come, whatever the need may be. And we'll thank you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Let's stand.